Gipuzkoako aldun nagusia eider mento. The Deputy General of uh, Gipuzkoa and the uh, Mayor of San Sebastian and the uh, representatives from the Basque government and in particular the um, Regional Minister for Economic Sustainability and the Environment, um, Mrs. Arantxa Tapia, the Director of Deus University, Juan Cuechevarria, and uh, the Rector of the University of Mondragon, Vicente Acha, dear authorities, dear friends, good afternoon everybody. And uh, thank you very much for coming here this afternoon. And today is a very important day for Orchestra because we are presenting the competitiveness report of 2023. And uh, my apologies for my voice, by the way, which I hope I will not lose during the event. We are here to improve uh, the competitiveness and well-being of the Basque Country based on research, focused on actions, and also by networking with the stakeholders in the territory and with the international reference centers. And the competitiveness report that we are submitting today, like every year, what it does is perform a diagnosis of how the different dimensions are evolving, and it identifies the challenges that we have to address in terms of competitiveness for the well-being of our society, and this year, it's uh, going to look into a very relevant issue, which is how to further competitiveness uh, with regard to sustainability. And as I usually say, without economic development, there will be no well-being, and without well-being, there will be no sustainable economic development either. And there's no person or sector in the economy that is not affected by the transition towards sustainability. And now, more than ever before, it is necessary for there to be a collaboration between the stakeholders and the citizens. We need to reduce, from a global perspective, we need to reduce uh, greenhouse gases at a global level. And we also have to make better use of natural resources that are becoming more and more scarce. And all of this has to be done at the lowest possible economic and social cost. So this is why it's necessary to draft suitable roadmaps so that we can meet the needs of the current generations without uh, compromising the needs of future generations and we have to guarantee the well-being of people and we have to maintain the level of competitiveness of our companies and jobs as we reduce our environmental footprint. But this transition towards sustainability or towards sustainable competitiveness is like a long-distance race, which means that we have to combine short-term measures as well as uh, long-term measures. So we will also have to prioritize the common good instead of the individual good, and we'll have to do so in the most fair possible manner. So what we have to do is make use of the major opportunities that we think exist and which are in front of us at the same time that we minimize uh, the undesired consequences. And the report that we're going to be presenting here does not uh, propose an optimum solution for the transformation process of the economy. Because as you will see in the report, there are no specific recipes nor any straightforward answers. But what we do believe is that this does provide uh, reflections and data which will allow the actors of the stakeholders to address uh, these significant challenges we have in front of us. In today's event, we're going to be kicking off with uh, the presentation to be given by Stefan Lechenbermer, who's uh, from the Karlsson Institute of Sustainability and is also a guest professor at Lund University in Sweden. And he's going to focus on how we can decarbonize regions with a high industrial weight, which is the case of the Basque region. And then after Stefan, every year, like we do every year, we're going to present uh, the results uh, from the Basque country and how things have evolved. And then immediately afterwards, we will be talking about the six dynamic levers of our competitive framework and how these levers can also further our competitiveness so that we can achieve sustainability. And we're going to have here the presence of relevant stakeholders in the territory like Aglima, Iobe, and BRTA and uh, the Basque government. And finally, we will present the conclusions and the recommendations uh, to achieve sustainably a sustainable environmental competitiveness. Our master of ceremonies this year is going to be Marijo Arangunin, who's the director general of Orchestra. 
So as regards the competitiveness report, I would just like to emphasize, and we'll look at the details later on, but this is a positive message, although with a certain caution. The positive um, issue is that even though the process is very complex, there's a significant potential in the Basque region to um, promote all of the elements that are required to achieve a high level of sustainability. So this is why we have to take uh, decisions that are complex, but we have to start right now with a clear vision of where it is we want to go so that we can make a better use of uh, economic, technological and industrial opportunities at the lowest possible social cost. And if we do things properly, we will end up very strong. But if we do things badly, we could have a negative impact on our economy and on the well-being of our society, and we wouldn't achieve our environmental objectives, which is our aspiration. Finally, and before we move on to the event itself, I would like to firstly thank all of uh, the people at Orgesta for their excellent work, or for the work they've been doing throughout the year. Thank you very much. And I would also like to thank companies and institutions for their support, the sponsors of Orquesta, without which Orquesta would not be a reality, nor would it be an international reference in terms of competitiveness for well-being. And finally, I would like to thank IOBE, because this event has been organized according to the Aronga Garbia methodology that allows you to minimize the negative impacts uh, that are associated with events, negative impacts for the environment. I hope that this will m manage to achieve a much more competitive Basque region with more well-being and uh, a Basque region that is more sustainable. So we will carry on working at Orquesta so that we can address these challenges. And uh, now we're going to give the floor to Arantxa Dapi, who is the Regional Minister for Economic Development, and thank you all very much for listening to me. Thank you. The authorities and uh, director and chairperson of Augusta, and uh, thank you all very much indeed for coming to this event this afternoon. And uh, thank you to the Orquesta Institute for the work that you've been doing year after year and also for presenting this competitiveness report. Today we're talking about sustainability and logically we have uh, the, we, this is a um, green challenge stamp. We have that stamp to hold this event. And well, things are changing very quickly and some very important developments are taking place in the world. All of this has its consequences, and obviously this has its effect too on our environment. But when we talk about competitiveness in terms of uh, Basque companies, but in addition to the pandemic uh, in the years 2020, 2021, in 2022, the Russian invasion started, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And this has had some significant effects for our economy. And today we are still suffering from the consequences. But not only that, but there's also another reality we have to cope with. And that is that last week, the Basque country was the capital of industry. And especially it was the capital of the SMEs at the inaugural session of the Basque Open Industry, we spoke about the competitiveness of Basque companies and we spoke about the situations that Basque companies are facing. We spoke about the internationalization plan, we spoke about the industrial sector, and we also analyzed the results obtained. So let's say that the data, the data are now being disclosed. So we must take into consideration that this industrialization and internationalization plan was initiated when the pandemic started in the last quarter of the year 2020. And the fundamental goal consisted in boosting uh, employment. So what we wanted to achieve, we wanted to recover our activity after the um, 
shut down in March, and as I say, this implemented was uh, this plan was implemented towards the end of the of the of the year 2020, so we to recover competitiveness and jobs. So at this point in time, and although we are still facing uncertainties, these goals are being achieved. So we have to carry on with this effort, with this work, because whatever unexpected things that crop up, events that we never expect to happen, if we are ready to address them, well, it will be obviously l easier to get things done. And the industrialization plan that was approved and that we're currently working with uh, started off with the pandemic. And the main objective was to recover the economic and uh, activity and jobs. So let's think that in March of 2020, what we had was the shutting down. Many of, uh, many of our jobs had to be shut down. Many of our workplaces had to be shut down. And although it was not a complete shutdown, it was partial. And there was a complete slowing down of our economy. So the main objective at the end of the year had to consist in recovering uh, jobs without forgetting, of course, that the three transitions that we were dealing with before the pandemic were speeding up in a very intense manner. So in other words, whatever had to do with digitization, which we'd been working on for some time, as well as the energy and climate transition and the demographic and social transition, um, meant that it was becoming necessary to carry out a transformation throughout Europe. But if we now focus on the climate transition, what has to do with the, the greenest and sustainable element related to the European Green Deal, we must consider that we're not doing this only out of necessity, but out of conviction. So this is why the Basque government decided to go ahead and that we were very innovative then. And it was all about incorporating the area of sustainability and environment to the area more related to industry, technology and to entrepreneurship. And it was, in fact, a very significant uh, challenge in those days. But after three years, uh, we can say that it has been and still is a major success. It was a very good move because sustainability and our efforts aimed at decarbonizing, especially in the case of the heavy industries, have represented an opportunity to strengthen the competitiveness of our production industry. And we have tried to integrate these environmental criteria in all of the sectoral policies and not as a conditioning factor, but rather as an opportunity and as a competitive factor and an opportunity to grow in the future. And then the energy transition. In, in our approach to um, renewables, we have made lots of progress, but there's still a very long way to go in the future. And we know that especially in the area of renewables, we know that we have uh, lots of work to do. That's why we have to develop this area even further. And from a political perspective, the infrastructures that we already have do have a significant, do exert a significant influence. But our industry has to be of the fact that this um, infrastructure is still fundamental. And we were also aware of the fact that it was necessary to have gas when the hostilities broke out in Ukraine. Well, part of our responsibility is all about working on this other line of action. Why? Because we are an innovative country. We are very well located or situated from a technological perspective. And this technology is becoming cleaner and cleaner and more innovative. But obviously, the energy, the field of energy is a field in which we have to carry on working without any doubt whatsoever. We know that this affects our competitiveness. So it is therefore essential to have an energy commitment. We need an agreement and an energy pact that was mentioned on more than one occasion by the president of the Basque government. Right now, we're working on the climate transition bill and on climate change, on the climate change bill, and perhaps this could have a much bigger impact of the Basque government because this new bill is going to be a first step, although it's not going to be the only one, but it can be considered to be the first step that will take us towards this future energy agreement that the president of the Basque country has mentioned on several occasions. 
So competitiveness that will allow our companies to uh, play the role of attractive agents for young people that are now joining the labor market, people that we need to have very close to our productive fabric by contributing value and by forming part of, uh, of this project, of this single project. So the brand of companies have to be much more sophisticated to attract people so that people find them interesting. And this is why we have the Basque talent strategy that we are currently developing with the provincial councils. We're updating it now. And this is where we offer a line of work, a line of work in which what we should do is uh, take a number of steps. And in other words, we should make further progress in this area because there we are facing a challenge and that is how can we attract people? How can we attract talent? How can we maintain the talent here? And what contributions can they make in terms of the industry? Because we need to have all these people with this talent and we have to work together, all of us, men and women. And this report that we are presenting here today is focused above all on sustainability, but it also addresses many other issues. And I hope that you will find that it's uh, very interesting for all of you so that we can learn from what has been done, but so that we can implement things too in practice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Regional Minister. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, wholeheartedly many thanks for being here this afternoon and for attending this event, for attending this presentation of the Competitiveness Report of the Basque Country 2023. But we're now going to continue with the um, script that Ivan pointed out at the beginning. And first of all, we're going to learn more about an experience that comes from abroad and that is related to the change against climate change, to the fight against climate change. What can we do to improve our competitiveness and well-being? We can align and develop simultaneously the uh, ecological transition and the competitiveness and well-being in the Basque Country. For that, we have with us uh, Stefan Lechtenboma, and uh, Stefan is a full professor in, in Kassel Institute for Sustainability in Germany and is also adjunct professor in, in Lund University in Sweden. His uh, main research and, and teaching activities are focused on national and subnational uh, policies on climate and energy policies in order to address uh, the decarbonization of the societies, especially in very high industrialized regions as, such as the Basque Country. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation, Stefan, and the floor is yours. <clears throat> yes, uh, thanks a lot, Maria Angela. Uh, thanks a lot to uh, the colleagues from Orchestra for inviting me to this very interesting panel, and I'm really happy to talk to people from Basque industry, society, institutions. And I think it's, it's extremely important to have these uh, groups together in, in one panel and to, to discuss the challenges of the transition jointly, uh, because we only can tackle the transition uh, in, in cooperation within the regions, and I hope I can contribute some uh, ideas from my research to it. So let me uh, start talking uh, about the decarbonization of European heavy industries, which is of course a huge challenge, but hopefully also has a big chances, particularly for the long-term competitiveness of um, Europe and European industries. Let me first start with the relevance of these industries. Um, three industries alone, steel, petrochemicals and cement, emit directly around 19-20% of global greenhouse gas emissions, global CO2 emissions, plus high energy use that they have on top of it. So that's really uh, big and relevant. And in these industries, it's really significant challenge to decarbonize, to um, get rid of the fossil uh, fuels in, in their energy intensive processes. However, even for a sustainable future, we will need these materials. Um, sustainable uh, railways, uh, passive houses, etc. You all need for the infrastructures, you need steel, cement, chemicals. So uh, we cannot get rid of that. We need to tackle uh, these sectors and, and really uh, make them clean and decarbonize them. And also this transition is urgent. 
um, you can see here um, most of these emissions are coming from a small number of big industrial assets. So this is the blast furnaces in the steel industry. That's the um, um, crackers in the petrochemical industries. That's the cement uh, ovens in the cement industry. And in Europe, for example, of these assets, by the end of the decade, we have to reinvest about 50% of them. So, and it's completely clear we cannot reinvest that with the technology we have today because there we would create huge stranded assets. So uh, we are really under pressure to invest this technology with the new sustainable technologies, which then of course needs green and sustainable energy in the future. And the challenge is not only a European one, it's also globally on, on the right side. You can see uh, the global perspective on, on blast furnaces in steel industry. And there it's even uh, over 70% that have to be um, reinvested by 2030 a huge share of that in China. So it's, it's not only European, it's, it's really a global challenge. And, and so how can we per perceive this challenge, this transition, how will it look like? And I would like to sort of bring you three arenas of this transition. The first one is about the new green energy technologies, which are basically the enablers of the transition. So that's all the technologies we need for renewable electricity, photovoltaics, wind, etc. Uh, and it's also electrification technologies on the demand side. First of all, the electric vehicles, the batteries, but also the heat pumps and others. It's less the carbon capture and the nuclear energy. And of course, it's a lot about critical materials that we need for these technologies. And this arena has been, uh, uh, so to say, uh, emerged to be one of the global uh, fields of geopolitics now. China has been very strategic in, in going for that ar arena and, and really becoming strong there. The US with the Inflation Reduction Act and, and other policies is coming strong uh, trying to attract these businesses because everybody perceives that will be a multi-billion multi uh, uh, dollar euro business in the future. Everybody needs these clean energy technologies. And so they want to be leaders. And the European Union also has become active. The Net Zero Industry Act, the Critical Resor Resources and Materials Act uh, are uh, um, maybe a little bit of a late start, but the EU is also working on it and trying to really uh, be active in this field. So that's about the transformation technologies, but that's not the only arena. There are two further arenas. The next is the climate neutral uh, um, but basic materials industries, so the heavy industries, which are really uh, the focus of the problem because there we emit all these emissions as, as I have shown. Uh, so um, how do we get steel, cement, petrochemicals, other basic industries, paper, uh, climate neutral? Um, how do we get the uh, non-fossil process technologies and the green energy supply, including the infrastructures <laughs> that we need there? Um, and how uh, do we make these industries more resource efficient and circular because resource efficiency and circularity, particularly in these materials industries, have a strong lever. Um, they reduce our need for critical resources. Uh, they reduce the need for, for mining of, of metals and, and other minerals. And uh, also uh, we save lots of the green energy, which is scarce. So that's really is an important strategy there. And last but not least, of course, we have to decarbonize all the other businesses and industries and create sustainable value chains there. And also there, maybe it's less critical from the cost perspective when you are not energy intensive to go for green energy, but still you need the green energy. You need to check your supply chains and you need to have long-term sustainable business cases there. So these are two further very important challenges that we also have, have to tackle. And of course, we, we need um, the overall uh, green energy for that. And so um, let me give you two examples of these industries, how it's working. Steel industry is already working a lot. Uh, there have been lots of announcement and now first investment decisions ongoing to invest in green steel, really billions in Germany, in Sweden, but other countries have also announced. I think there's even uh, projects in, uh, in the pipeline for Spain on that. So that's really going on. Uh, but let me uh, show you the petrochemicals industry, which is also a very important industry, particularly economically uh, for, for Europe. And there we have a double challenge. 
On the one hand, we have the energy, which is on the bottom of the chart. And uh, so far, petrochemicals use, besides the embedded energy in their feedstocks, they, they use mainly natural gas and quite a huge amount of electricity. And that has to be converted uh, pretty quickly. Already over the next 10, 15 years, we need to phase out natural gas, mainly converted to electricity, so electrification. But hydrogen will also play a role. So that's really a, a huge challenge, but it's not the only challenge, uh, the only challenge in that sector. Um, petrochemicals are also using mineral oil basically as a physical input. And that's also fossil uh, and in the end also needs to be avoided because typically ends, it ends up in the incineration and in the atmosphere again, sometimes already after months. And so we have to convert that as well. And we uh, need to uh, feed in uh, to get in plastic waste basically as a new feedstock. So become even there much more circular. We will need synthetic feedstocks that as Europe we might import from, from elsewhere where renewables are cheaper. Uh, biomass is a very interesting feedstock, but uh, also offers lots of, of opportunities, uh, also technologically, and last but not least, hydrogen again will be important to create uh, the reacting energy. So um, that's this double um, challenge that we have in petrochemicals, and that will meet, uh, need massive investments, uh, particularly in waste treatment plant and methanol-based routes in the petrochemical industry. That's really an important strategy. However, using biomass there even uh, creates challenges to get negative emissions. Um, the wrong button. Uh, another chart is uh, natural gas. We already heard from, from the minister that, that natural gas is a big issue and I think uh, European industries today use lots of natural gas in all heat uh, temperature ranges, particularly in the, in the high temperature, which is more difficult to electrify. Uh, um, there's mainly is gases plus, plus some biomass. Uh, and we need to be pretty quick uh, to also phase that out overall in the industry. Uh, already by 2030 in our scenario analysis, uh, we see almost complete uh, phase out of natural gas and, and by 2040, uh, no natural gas at all. Um, if you look at it, electrification again here will play a major role in, in all temperature levels, even in the high temperatures, we have opportunities to electrify. Biomass is another solution that will shift to the higher temperatures because uh, that is a prob problem solver there, uh, plus hydrogen. But in our perspective, hydrogen will sort of remain limited in, in the industry to really those fields where it, it solves solutions that other options cannot do. So um, as you see, we need lots of green electricity for the industrial transition and we are on um, the way back to the technology and infrastructure uh, uh, challenge. So where will the green energy be needed and where will it come from? And on that m map on the left, you can see uh, the industrial hotspots of Europe. So that's where the additional electricity for decarbonizing the industry, including hydrogen, uh, will be needed spatially if industry remains where it is. Um, and you can see it's just a small number of spots all over Europe where industry is really quite concentrated. Um, here in northern Spain, there, there are some spots. Uh, there's uh, the mega cluster in the Netherlands, Flanders, Western Germany, which, which is really very big. Um, and there, of course, we need extreme amounts of green energy. And the other map uh, shows the electricity demand versus the potential for green electricity the potential for green electricity production in Europe and you see the dark red that's the spot where we really need much of it and have much population density uh, little chances to produce all that so we have an energy deficit there but in Scandinavia but also in the Mediterranean region including parts of Spain there's a potential surplus so these are the regions where we can produce and so uh, the important challenge is to bring the sufficient green energy potentials, the potentials are sufficient in the European Union, uh, to the places where we need the energy and combine it with a, with a good uh, import strategy. That will be, uh, mean additional electricity infrastructure, additional investment in green um, energy. Uh, but let me give you one example. Uh, this is the hydrogen. 
That's the vision from the gas transport, uh, long gas, distance gas transporters. And they want to convert their pipeline to hydrogen pipelines. And that's quite a good strategy because it's technologically possible. And there you can see their vision of a European hydrogen backbone for 2030. That vision is currently uh, um, regularly updated. And you see there's quite an extended pipeline network. Much of it is relying on existing pipelines. So we can repurpose uh, existing natural gas pipelines. We will see hopefully strong intra-European hydrogen trade via onshore and offshore pipelines. Uh, so we will get hydrogen from the North Sea Scandinavia, but also from the Mediterranean, maybe even from Northern Africa. Um, and we can also use that system to import from overseas. However, it's still unclear about the competitiveness because ship transport of hydrogen is extremely costly and may not be competitive. Um, and what we probably also will see is parts of our industry, the really early parts of the value chain, which are extremely energy intensive, may, we may see some relocation. There are already indications within Europe to go to Sweden, to go to Spain for the energy. Even within Germany, some companies go to the north where there is more green energy. So we will see some of that, but most probably and hopefully uh, limited. This is a screenshot of uh, Spain and Portugal. And you see also Spain and Portugal is, is in the map and, and also this region, northern, northern Spain, Basque country. What is particularly interesting for the uh, cost of hydrogen is not only to produce it and transport it, also to store it is very interesting because you can store it. And that's an advantage it has from electricity. And you uh, best store is the salt caverns. And here in northern Spain, there are salt caverns. Uh, as far as this map shows, the only ones in Spain and, and the region. So that's probably a, a very attractive potential to really tap into the Spanish resources of uh, hydrogen. And of course, Germany, for example, the Netherlands will be interested in importing this green energy from here. So how can we come to this? What, what do we need to do policy-wise? Um, I think first message, we need integrated industrial uh, policies and strategies, and we have to integrate them along the value chain. I already emphasized the relevance of circularity, and that therefore I start with the end. So we need policies to really close these recycling loops, because that's not all but easy. Uh, big industries, big petrochemical industries now is used to source from multis like Shell BP. So they have to source in the future from a waste industry that is uh, with small amounts, very dispersed. So that needs policy support in, in order to, to uh, be created. And of course, also, um, we should use these materials extremely efficient. So that means in the, in the use of the materials, um, if we can have longer lifetimes of buildings, longer lifetimes of cars machinery, that helps uh, and may create added value. Um, this is, of course, important step for the uh, manufacturing sector because there, where the products are made, it's decided how efficient it is, is and how long they will last, etc. And last but not least, what I started with in the heavy industry. There we need new technologies, big investments, and we need the respective infrastructure. And I don't go into detail into this. The European Union in, in the yellow back boxes has policies on all elements, so that's quite good. But I think still, uh, we have to work a lot to implement them and to make them work hand in hand to really enable an integrated policy along this strategic value chain perspective. Uh, that's very, very important. And that means in the end that we also get to integrate uh, uh, lots of policies. So from energy policy, trade policy, resource policy, circular economy policy, but also research uh, and climate policy need all to be integrated. And, and one field, uh, not to forget, very important, regional and structural policy. Because all of this industrial transition is located somewhere. In regions like the Basque country, in regions like North and Westphalia, where I come from. Um, and um, so it needs to be implemented there. It needs to be accepted and, and invented there. And there, therefore, regional strategies is very important. So we need to have the policy package really integrated and target-oriented, 
and we need to create new modes of societal cooperation of all stakeholders in, in a region because a company can invest in a hydrogen-based steel making but they cannot create their own infrastructure. They need uh, to have hydrogen infrastructure. They need somebody to invest in, in the production of the hydrogen. They need uh, societal support and acceptance. So that's really um, an important um, field that uh, we see. And last uh, thing, I would like to present you an example from North Rhine-Westphalia, where in 2018, we created uh, an initiative called Info Climate North Rhine-Westphalia. Um, North Rhine-Westphalia uh, is, I think, the largest European Union. It is the uh, largest German state with 18 million inhabitants and is also home of 50% of industrial greenhouse gas emissions of Germany and uh, over 10% of Europe. So it's, it's really um, big in emissions. And there we created this initiative with, to date, uh, 45 companies. So. Shell, BP, ThyssenKrupp, Covestro, really big, big names, uh, seven research institutions and the state government also within it, and, and partly the trade associations, but we directly interact with the companies there. And that's, uh, that initiative started with the shared vision that we want to achieve a climate neutral and competitive uh, basic industry for the state. So we want to remain these in industries there uh, have them competitive, get them, keep them competitive, uh, and make them climate neutral, which is, of course, a big challenge. However, with this collaboration, we could pro uh, produce uh, a number of reports and policy papers, which were uh, pretty uh, influential. When you have these companies, you can even go to Brussels and, and talk to the Commission, and, and you are heard. And I think that uh, was helpful for the hydrogen strategy, for the industry strategy, for the carbon management strategy, which the state already has, which the federal government is now making. So these important uh, features, uh, we, we could help. And we could make the interests of the industry being heard. What we are still have, have to work on in this context is the integration with society. Um, that's also ongoing, but that is uh, the next big step for us to do, because in the end, uh, people have to understand that in order to be able to support it, and, and we need that societal support. So let me conclude. Um, the combined energy and industry transition is extremely urgent for three regions, reasons. Of course, climate change, extremely urgent. I think last Saturday we first time uh, crossed the two degrees threshold. Um, but there's also a big reinvestment challenge for our industry and there's big global competition on it. So it's not just about the climate, it's also about our economic future. Europe has entered uh, this race for the clean energy transition, uh, but a little bit a latecomer. And I think industrial regions have high stakes in, the develop in, in this development but by creating joint visions, uh, they are important actors in that. And so uh, I really congratulate the Basque region to, to be on the way to this, on the way to sustainability, and wish you all the uh, uh, success for a sustainable Oiskadi. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Stefan, for uh, your insight about how to develop simultaneously this uh, environmental transition and also to address the competitiveness issues and challenges that we have in highly industrialized regions, such uh, in different regions in Germany and also in, in the Basque Country. Orain, okay. Well, now let's move on to the competitiveness report, the 2023 competitiveness report that analyzes how we can progress towards uh, sustainable competitiveness. How can we do this? As is well known, climate change represents a very significant challenge, one of the biggest challenges that mankind has ever faced. And the truth is, if greenhouse gases emissions are not reduced or if they don't reach zero,
this will mean that uh, our economic and environmental conditions will be unbearable for the human being. And this is a global challenge. It's an international challenge, as we all know. But each and every one of us could exert some influence from where we stand or from where we work. But this challenge also requires some very complex transformations because there are many ash issues that produce climate change. And this climate change also has an effect on many different areas. For instance, the funding requirements or how people behave and uh, economic activities and so on and so forth. So there are no magic recipes, but at least what we can see is which uh, elements could assist us in this um, path we want to walk down. And this is what we uh, want to do in this annual report. And this is our analysis and this is our reflection too. In our report, we have set three objectives. On the one hand, we want to analyze the current um, status of competitiveness and of well-being in the Basque Autonomous Community. And this is what we're showing here in the central box that can be seen in blue. Because if we have better indicators, will we be better off? We will be more ready to address this challenge that I referred to before. And the second objective would have to do with understanding the connection that exists between a sustainable transition on the one hand and competitiveness and well-being on the other. So if we understand this interaction, we would also have a better understanding of how we can uh, work on these two issues. And then thirdly, this is all about working on six dynamic levers that could help make compatible sustainability with competitiveness and well-being. Okay, so these are the ones you can see on the right-hand side of this uh, framework. But we have to ask ourselves three questions. So firstly, how can we achieve a compatibility between the factors of uh, a sustainable transition and competitiveness? Because the stronger we are to develop both aspects, we will make progress in the two parts of this uh, area. But secondly, how can we make this transformation be effective eff and efficacious? And as uh, was pointed out before by the regional minister, how can we make the most of all the opportunities that this is generating as regards creating new jobs and new activities, etc.? because, well, we need to have much more stability. And finally, what happens when the sustainable transition and competitiveness for well-being, what, is it, what happens when they're not compatible? Because this is something that could happen. So what do you have to do in those instances, in those cases in which there's no compatibility? So this first question of uh, what our results are from economic and competitiveness and well-being perspective, well, we have here with us this afternoon, we have James Wilson, who's the Director of Research at Orquesta, and Susana Franco, who's a Senior Researcher at Orquesta. And they're going to be explaining the position of the Basque country compared with other regions to answer that first question that we were mentioning in the report. So thank you very much. You both have the floor now. Thank you very much, Marijo. Well, good afternoon, everybody. This is a starting point now for the next uh, stage of the transition. We would like to explain where we stand right now in terms of uh, competitiveness and well-being results. And this is the starting point that would allow us to address uh, the challenges that uh, Marijo and Stefan have been talking about and uh, which are going to be mentioned later on again. But the snapshot we have in terms of uh, the traditional competitive results, that is economic results, is a very positive picture, generally speaking. But if we were to take a look at the two classical um, indicators, which are the GDP per capita and uh, business profitability, we can see that after the slumps brought about by the pandemic in 2020, 21 and 22, there's been a sustained uh, recovery in GDP per capita and in company profitability. And the GDP per capita went up in 2022 and it now stands at 109.5% of the European average. It still has a way to go to recover 115% that it had before the pandemic, but in 2022 it grew more than the European average. So that means that it is now closing the gap that uh, was opened up during the pandemic. So we're on the right way in terms of uh, 
income per capita. But when we look at the business profitability, in 2022 there was a strong recovery which totaled 5%. Although it's important to bear in mind that this is an average figure and there are sectors in which profitability is taking longer to recover and others is taking less. So we always have to bear in mind these nuances when we analyze the figures. But I'd say that generally speaking, the figure is very positive. But what we could also see is that these good end results uh, in terms of uh, competitiveness and profitability and income per capita are, have a strong base as regards recovering productivity. In 2022, productivity went up 8%. And we've also seen in 2022 that there was a slight improvement in the number of SMEs that innovate, which is another important element. And we've seen a strength, a strengthening of our position at, on the regional innovation scoreboard, which is a, a sample of how strong our innovation system is. And we've seen an increase in the exports of goods, which now stand at 38.3% of the GDP, which is a record figure as regards our exports. So we have a global vision that is uh, very positive. And what we're going to do is uh, look into some of these nuances in a little bit more detail. Now, Susanna is going to kick off now with productivity. Yes, because although this... Uh, image is generally speaking positive there are some elements that we believe we have to pay more attention to and that is productivity is one of them because the charts you can see on screen you can see how productivity has evolved relative to the total figure of the economy and in the manufacturing sector and what we can see is that although in the overall economy productivity in the Basque country is higher than the Spanish productivity and the European average until 2019 it was uh, pretty like the German productivity there was but with a slump of 2020 we are now uh, further away from that figure in the last two years it has increased and we're closing the gap but we've not yet reached the productivity levels they have in Germany and then on the right hand side of the chart when you look at the manufacturing sector what you will be able to see is that the productivity of our manufacturing set is pretty similar to that of Spain and of the EU so yes there is a challenge so that we can carry on increasing productivity and in order to achieve this uh, innovation is going to be one of the key elements and in the report, what we can see is that the main innovation figures that we analyze, that is the percentage of SMEs that innovate and exports, uh, the figures have improved. But it's also important to um, explain this improvement because when you look at these figures, there are some elements that also make us think about other items. Like, for instance, when we are analyzing the first eye for innovation, we have improved our position and we've increased R&D. We've also increased the number of SMEs that innovate, but there's still a very big gap between the percentage of companies that innovate and the European average and uh, leading uh, countries like Germany. And we also have the entrepreneurship activity rate, which is relatively low compared with other territories. So that means that we have to be persistent in our efforts which we've been um, carrying out for many years so that we can improve the innovation culture of our SMEs and also improve the entrepreneurship spirit of our society. This is a constant message that we repeat every year when we come to this event and when we submit the report and that is because innovation is critical for competitiveness in the future. So we shouldn't be surprised by the fact that this is a message that appears year after year. But in any case, it's something that we have to bear in mind. But more specifically this year, we have uh, looked into green innovation and we've uh, studied our SMEs to see how they are reporting their green innovation. And I think that this um, gives uh, more importance to innovation because for sustainable transition for this challenge, innovation is absolutely critical. And 80% of our SMEs that innovate say that they have obtained environmental benefits through their innovation which gives us an idea of how important innovation is for sustainable transition. And it's also true that the number of companies that have, inc have seen increases in the prices of materials and energy have also feel motivated. And they also, this also shows that they're motivated to innovate because this improves their competitiveness and also improves their environmental performance. So as regards the second eye for internationalization, but if we look at the figures in detail, 
you can see that there has been a significant growth in terms of uh, exports of goods. But let's say that part of this uh, improvement in exports has been brought about by energy products, which we know have increased their price a lot in the last year. So this has two implications if we want to look into the figures in greater detail. On the one hand, we have imports that have also grown significantly, and our performance in this respect between the in the commercial balance has uh, produce some differences because there has been an increase in imports and exports too. But if we consider services in this analysis on exports, our performance doesn't compare as favorably with other regions. And when we include services and when we look into the exchanges taking place with the rest of the country, the balance for the Basque country is negative. So this is where we do have um, some food for thought. And this is a consequence of the circumstances, of the current circumstances, increases in the price of materials, of energy, that our industrial companies depend on to carry out their activities. But this also shows that it's necessary to continue with its efforts and extend um, our basis of innovative companies so that more and more of our companies can export not only industrial firms but also service companies and uh, companies related to the industrial sector. And when we move on to the results in terms of well-being, because it would be of no use for the economy to improve if this does not mean that there's going to be much better well-being for the people that live in the region, what we can also see is that there have been some high levels of well-being in several of the dimensions that we've analyzed. So, for instance, as regards the employment dimension, what we can see is that the rate of unemployment has been reduced. It now stands below 8%, which is half of what we had in the year 2013. And the wage gap, gender wage gap per hour work also shows a downgoing trend. And in 2021, it was 7%, which shows that women uh, women are making 7% less than men for going to work on average. But in the year 2013, it was 20%. So there has been a positive trend. But when we look into the um, dimension of our social lives, you can see that people's satisfaction with having enough time to do whatever they feel like doing has increased little by little. And you can see in the first year of the pandemic, there was a very big slump in terms of confidence. But the Basque country was a much better positioned compared to other parts of Spain. And also having a safe environment is an important thing to be able to uh, lead our social lives. And this is where we can see that this is a positive indicator because when we analyze the rate of criminality against private property in the Basque country, it was 639 uh, criminal acts per every 100,000 inhabitants, where in Germany it was nearly double than what we have here. And as regards the learning uh, dimensions, well, there's still a positive evolution underway in the case of uh, people with uh, higher education. 70% of the people living in the Basque country have um, a higher education. It's still lower than the European average, but let's say that the gap is being closed up compared to the European average and the German average. And 17.5% of the people between 25 and 64 years of age in the Basque country had participated in permanent learning activities. And in this respect, the Basque country does play an outstanding role compared to the rest of the region's health. This is another thing that we would like to underscore, in which we are well positioned because the Basque uh, country has a high life expectancy, 83.7 years. and. There's also a high percentage, 75% of the people, three out of every four, consider that they enjoy good or very good health. It's not about living many years, but it's also about living with good health. And uh, this, in this health dimension, we've included a new indicator that allows us to relate health to sustainability and to the environment. And this indicator has to do with early deaths produced by air pollution and by analyzing this indicator, you can see that generally speaking, in all the territory, these uh, levels are dropping. But in the case of the Basque region, where it was uh, 31 deaths that can be uh, 
that are produced by air pollution, which is much lower compared to the European average, which was 54. And in the context of this uh, positive picture of well-being that uh, Susanna just painted, I would like to zoom in on some of the main indicators. Perhaps they're not really moving in the right direction, and one of them has to do with um, material life. And we can see that in 2021 there was a decline of 4% in the average income, equivalent income of households. So that means that the average household in Spain has 4% less income compared to 2020, although there was an increase in GDP per capita. And this was also something that was uh, followed by a um, slight increase in inequality in 21. And in 22, there was a stronger increase in energy poverty. So there are certain indicators that are moving in directions that we should monetize a little bit carefully. And it's equally true that the average income is much higher compared to the European figures. And uh, that is inequality and uh, energy uh, poverty are um, at the same level as the European average, but much lower compared to the rest of Spain. So the news is not all that bad. But I think that it does allow us to think in terms of making sure that this change of direction for these indicators in the last two years should not become something permanent. And it's something that we will carry on monitoring over the next few years so that we can reflect upon this in greater depth. And the final dimension that we analyze when we look into well-being has to do with the environment. And this is done because of uh, the impact that uh, this has on the living conditions, not only of uh, people, as we've seen in the indicator of deaths produced by pollution, but also this has to do with the uh, future generations. But in the report, what we show is that uh, greenhouse gas emissions associated with the productions are reducing, are dropping, but we're still far away from the targets we've set at an international scale. So that means that we have to make further progress. And not only that, but when we look at the impact we have in terms of the environment, we should not only consider what is produced in the environment, but we also have to look at our consumer patterns. So this is why in the report we analyze the total uh, carbon footprint and to calculate that total carbon footprint you have to bear in mind imports because uh, Stefan was talking about uh, value chains but we have to bear in mind these imports to cover inputs of the production process as well as to meet the final demand of households and we have to take into account how many emissions are related to transporting them and uh, what is produced uh, directly in the Basque country and the electricity we have to import for that production and uh, with that we will be able to conclude how much is exported and consumed in other territories and this gives us the blue bar that you can see here that has been calculated for the years 2016 18 and 20 but from 16 to 20 it's remained pretty constant and well considering that it was an atypical year so there's also room to improve them and it so happens that in the analysis that we perform on the competitiveness levers in the report, what we want to do is find some clues that will help us to reduce our impact on the environment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Susanna and James. Well, as they've explained, and for um, the sustainable transition, we have a number of solid foundations, but we are also dealing with several challenges. And now we're going to be focused on six dynamic levers, thanks to which it is possible for us to take measures to make the sustainable transition compatible with uh, well-being so that we can try to bring in line all of the results that have to do with economic development and well-being and uh, environmental sustainability. And in order to do so, we're going to be kicking off with the three first levers that have to do with natural capital, physical capital, and uh, funding. And this analysis is going to be shared uh, with us by Macarena Larrea, who's an orchestra researcher, Olga Martin, who's the director of Genova Clima, and Maria Garcia, who's the director of uh, IOBE Strategy and Innovation Department. Thank you very much for being here this afternoon. 
to um, share your reflections with us. And as we say at Orquesta, we carry out transformative research and it's uh, research to change things and they're going to help us to see how it is we can connect the recommendations that emerge from the analysis in our report to see what can be done in real terms in the actions and policies that you're implementing at Aklima and Iobe. Thank you very much. Well, as Marijo has pointed out, we're going to be starting off by talking about the natural capital lever. Natural capital is made up of natural of resources of a territory, and here we include energy, water, biological resources, and minerals. And we also include uh, the quality of air. That Susana has spoken about the quality of water and of soil too. Okay, so. Uh, Sustainable transition means that we have to reinterpret the industrialization of the territory based on the cumulative regulations applicable to sustainability to reconfigure or to improve competitiveness and to reduce the environmental footprint. And in this context, the natural capital can help us improve the competitiveness of the territory by reducing dependence on other countries, for instance, uh, raw materials that we import and uh, also by creating new business activities based on renewable organic matter or solutions based on nature, etc. But in the specific case of energy, the Basque country has a 68.6% dependence on fossil fuels that we import. Normally it's uh, oil and its byproducts for transportation and gas for industrial activities at high temperatures and heating. Renewables in 2021 accounted for 16.6% of the total figure. But to advance towards uh, this uh, figure of 20% of renewables that the plan has established for 2021-24, the so-called PTS, the sectoral plan for renewables, establishes potential uh, figures, 2,500 megawatts of PV, 1,100 of uh, onshore wind power and 2,450 megawatts of other technologies. However, it is expected that with this deployment of renewables, we will not be achieving the community objectives of 2030 of 42.5 or 45%. That was the figure we set for that year. And it's necessary to, uh, I don't know, have uh, more PV roofs which would be 2,600 megawatts as well as other initiatives um, supported by initiatives like energy communities. We shouldn't forget either the potential that uh, green hydrogen has uh, which uh, in fundamentally in sectors that are very difficult to decarbonize as Stefan pointed out previously and obviously we should not forget the element that is underlying which is uh, savings and efficiency and energy rehabilitation. And in the last few decades, the Basque country has uh, advanced in all of these areas. But our report, in our report, we mentioned a number of uh, challenges that have to do with these resources. For instance, the need to implement more renewables and uh, having a stable supply of raw materials, a proper management of water resources, or a reduction of gas. Uh, greenhouse gases, as Susana pointed out. But apart from these specific challenges, there are others that we've called transversal and which are associated with the rest of the levers are going to be seeing. We could mention, for instance, the need to have funding or the need to have knowledge adapted to this new uh, field of activities and obviously new uh, competencies or skills. Olga. So how can you prioritize from Aglima the decision-making process of where to invest and where to know where we have to act, bearing in mind the, how extensive the challenge is? Well, firstly, I would like to leave three things clear. For Aglima, whatever is coming from Europe is an opportunity framework, and we are now able to generate new business models that can meet the European regulations and this is an opportunity framework where we can develop new business models, new technologies, new companies and new green jobs. Bearing in mind that the funding is also becoming green because of all the legislation taxonomies and Europe 
investments investments have to deal with more and more sustainable projects and taxonomy is going to tell you what is environmental and what isn't and then we also have efficacy in terms of resources this was mentioned by Stefan and that is that waste is a, a very valuable resource that we should know how to use and maintain and then we are equally lucky in the Basque country of having an environmental sector that has uh, lots of knowledge which will allow us to carry out this ecological transition and support the rest of the sectors so that they can become involved too. So what do we need? First we need strategic surveillance. Whatever comes from Europe is enormous and we have to keep an eye open because as regulations are being approved and they are binding in all member states so that means that Europe doesn't want there to be any differences between regions and member states so we have to pay attention to what is coming our way innovation environmental innovation in all of the areas for waste for energy efficiency and how we use biodiversity to plan the territory the cities how we are generating things to adapt to nature our coastline whatever has to do with the pollution, all of these new technologies that we can develop so that we can reduce these emerging pollutants mentioned by Europe, so there's a very extensive field. And then how can we also, there's talent, talent that wants to work in the field of the environment, but how can we do this? Because the environment in the Basque country is fundamentally industrial, it's uh, dirty, so we need to get this talent to work on this environment we have. And finally, collaboration public-private partnerships um, collaboration between companies along the value chain. We can't do everything we're supposed to do if there's not a collaboration. Thank you very much. And a very quick question, just one minute. What difficulties are Basque uh, companies uh, addressing or facing, especially SMEs, as regards addressing this issue of sustainability? Well, first you have to understand that this is strategic. We can't wait for the legislation to be published. We have to tell SMEs that they have to think about changing their business models and their products so that they can move into a sustainable market. And this is a very complex business. So how do we address innovation? And also, uh, we need a demonstration project to see how the Basque country can become a region in which we can generate uh, demonstration projects. And also with uh, governance procedures that are more agile, because now in this is coming from Europe. How can how can we uh, set up what is called a sandbox and this is a field in which uh, we have procedures and governance mechanisms that make things easier so that this upcoming legislation can be um, managed properly respecting all the environmental um, needs and there's something very important that I would like to mention too and in the Basque country we have a major opportunity as regards the evaluation of waste and we have a severe problem as regards implementing these infrastructures because people don't want these infrastructures but we have to understand that we have to manage our own environmental impacts as a society we need a plan of environmental infrastructures so that this uh, waste can be transformed into a material because we've seen a presentation from Germany and they spoke about uh, plastics and biomass and with that they're going to make energy we can do that here because there are companies that can do it so how can we boost these investments in environmental infrastructures reaching a consensus so that we can all materialize these things in the Basque country? Well, thank you very much because this is, connects to our next lever which is that of physical capital. And uh, well, Olga has just put it out and to value all the natural resources we've spoken about before, we need to have new investments in infrastructures. And this means that we have to promote a straightforward and transparent legal frameworks, frameworks that are stable, that have to be smart and geared towards results, but with sufficient resilience so that they can be implemented by companies to maintain their competitiveness in our territory and abroad. And as a consequence of this new infrastructure, we will improve connectivity, the connectivity of the Basque territory with other external places, and we will favour our response capability of should anything occur because we would then have uh, a strong industrial innovation and a strong industrial fabric and we will reinforce the value chains that specialize for instance in energy efficiency in energy communities in civil engineering etc and we will also favor 
the access of people to essential services. We will support that access. Rather. The rate of uh, variation in terms of uh, investment in physical capital has evolved in the last 10 years in a positive manner in the Basque region with an increase of 2.2% in the case of the general economy and 48 in the industry. However, we need to develop new infrastructures in the case of transport and telecommunications and we have to adapt what we already have and will have in the future to the possible impacts that climate change is going to have. Let's just imagine a port area with the increase in the height of the sea and this would uh, block the commercial and logistics activities of harbours so we have to adapt to that too. Once again, as in the previous case, this requires s we have to address specific challenges in the case of the different infrastructures. For instance, uh, the energy infrastructure and the industrial infrastructure and the communications infrastructure, transport, buildings, etc. But we also need to address other kinds of uh, transverse challenges. And the first one has already been mentioned by Olga, which has to do with social acceptance. And secondly, we have to achieve a holistic planning of such an extensive issue. We must attract investments for new energy infrastructures, for transport and telecommunications. We need to get support for strategic projects like Net Zero Basque Cluster, for instance, or the Basque Hydrogen Corridor. And we have to adapt to the infrastructures like uh, the critical structures of hospitals to do better cope with the climate change. Maria, so how do the public institutions address the issue of social acceptance? Well, from the Department of Environmental Affairs, and uh, as Olga has just pointed out, we obviously have to urgently work on the challenge of social acceptance because the major infrastructures that the country requires to make further progress in a sustainable system socially and environmentally requires uh, social support and we have to reduce that gap that sometimes appears between different projects that are not even specific but they produce adverse reactions from certain parts of society so what is it I think we should intensify we have to intensify work in relation to the common good this concept has to be taken into account and has to be prioritized vis-a-vis uh, -vis a specific interest uh, of somebody. So the extent to which we work in favor of this common good and to the extent to which we try to achieve more cohesion and solidarity, we will make progress in this acceptance of these uh, major infrastructures but also of smaller projects too. But it's equally important for us to take into account that in the Basque region we have an advantage that helps us work in this direction and that is that uh, we have to bring the Basque population in line with sustainable development. But last week mm, the citizens perception study was published on circuit economy and there was uh, something that I found uh, was very relevant and that is that 98% of the Basque citizens considers that the environmental environmental quality is one of the fundamental uh, factors for their own quality of life. So if Basque citizens are associating environmental quality with quality of life, we must assume that once an infrastructure has been identified as something that is necessary, we have legal instruments that will guarantee that this infrastructure is going to be built with the lowest possible environmental impact. And of course, safeguarding against any possible adverse effect for people's health. And now, in just one minute, it's a very difficult question. How do you address an integral and holistic planning for an investment that we're talking about here with lots of uh, infrastructures but which are interconnected? Well, very quickly, I think that this is uh, related to what you mentioned before because traditionally when we have drafted uh, planning instruments, we have uh, used about 100% of the resources for the instrument to developing a good, a fantastic instrument and we've left part of the budget very residual for participation, information, awareness raising and communication. So ultimately, the expert planners that come from Europe and other parts of the world, what they agree is that we should at least dedicate no less than 20% of the budget we have for the planning instrument to present that instrument. And this is how our citizens 
with better information will have a higher degree of acceptance and in the end if all of this planning is coherent everything's going to turn out much more straightforward and I have an example until a short time ago and this was mentioned by the regional minister before in energy and climate change there are two sectors that are now intimately related to each other we have the same objectives although with different quantitative values to be reached in the same time horizon and this is something that shouldn't happen we have to be able to have a 360 degree vision so that citizens understand why we need infrastructures projects and policies and instruments okay well thank you very much and now we're going to be moving on to the third lever which has to do with funding which is related to what Maria pointed out that is at least 20 percent of the budget should be dedicated to communication so what we've seen is that this is a key element to uh, value resources and to address the investments that are underway there's a funding gap because of information uh, projects because there's a lack of knowledge and a lack of standardization and information is not disseminated and also governance issues and um, there's not always a coincidence between the public administration's interest and private interest and it has been mentioned that in the next few years we're going to have to make investments that could uh, represent up to five percent of the GDP of the world in infrastructures of this kind and in the Basque region we have a regular regularized regulated economy but there's also a delocation of the decision-making centers and the loss of industrial entrenchment because advancing in the promotion of an ecosystem for sustainable funding will um, allow us to reinforce the, uh, the financial fabric and this will also um, improve our links with the industry and will favor uh, the uh, sustainable transition and we also have the capacity and knowledge that our financial fabric has the Basque country is a territory that has been innovative in terms of sustainable funding and in fact what they've done well they've, there have been eight issues of sustainable bonds and this is making it possible to create the necessary conditions required for this funding and there's a total funding of about five billion euros since 2015 but apart from that and in the first issues there was a pretty high um, level of representation that eventually disappeared when new private and public stakeholders appears that became involved in this market of sustainable bonds but we could also extract our own learnings from other cases for instance our report mentions the case of Finland with its roadmap and its pilot project or Great Manchester with a local fund to promote private investments as regards the future the main challenge that the Basque country is facing is having a sustainable financial ecosystem that provides funds and favors the competitors of the economic fabric in our current context in which there's a significant response on in the case of China and the United States to the European Green Deal two minutes for each one of you first the Olga so what uh, problems are Basque companies and SMEs facing to access funding well, we've never uh, found so much money in the area of the environment, and that is the transition mechanism. Prior to COVID-19, we have 37% uh, of the money that arrives in Spain has to go to environmental issues. Otherwise, if it would be terrible. So, well, as regards the circular economy program in the Basque country, we had 54 projects with SMEs to build a circular economy project was 365 million euros and it was nearly 450 jobs and very few of these projects have worked out in the end because the truth is that it's very complicated for them and it's difficult because of the bureaucracy and in the end there are other kinds of subsidies because the Department of Economic Promotion and Yobe and the regional ministry are launching quite a lot of projects and subsidies but it's very difficult to know what it is you have to do with your tiny projects and we have to tell people what they have to do and how they have to do it in terms of funding and I think that there we have to make a collaborative effort between the public and the private sector there's a very interesting example which is the project we're carrying out between Aklima and the regional ministry for sustainability and the plastic platform and we're trying to define the supply 
of uh, waste or secondary materials we have in the Basque country, what demand there is, and with the legal instruments and with other kinds of technology, see how we can generate a circular economy so that this material, which is recycled plastic, can remain here and produce value. And here the public and private collaboration is uh, very interesting to be able to um, see which are the important infrastructures that we should be implementing. For Maria, uh, representing the public authorities, how should we um, manage public funding so that SMEs and so that uh, citizens can have an easy access? Because in a report it seems that we have an observatory covering aid. But are we citizens, do we citizens know that that exists? Well, I think no, that people don't know. I'd like to say that they do, but it's they don't really. We've, let's say we've been working for a long time in this, we've been modifying the production system. We want it to be more sustainable, to be, to be greener, to be uh, more inclusive too. But from our point of view, what we aren't going to be able to do is uh, modify a production system and achieve more sustainability without modifying the financial system. The financial system has been designed for a linear economy and we are asking that it be moved around a bit so that it can adapt to the circular system. And this is something we cannot do. So from Europe, well, we have all the trends that you mentioned before, sustainable taxonomy, which is a metric to tell us what is sustainable and what is not sustainable, so that we can actually channel the funding that arrives well, mainly from the public sector. But our sustainable taxonomy is a regulatory framework that is very extensive, very complex, and that SMEs are not able of uh, reaching out to it. So what do we have to do? Simplify things. Financial institutions are resorting to IOBE and I know to SPRI and to many other institutions to clarify this system. In the Basque country, what are we doing? We have in the Department of the Environment, we have two basic instruments. What they're trying to do is channel funding from the public and private sector for SMEs. We have the Basque list of clean technologies, which is a very straightforward instrument whereby identifying technologies that are more or less innovative, what they do is improve environmental performance and um, state that they do meet the European regulations. And so there's a way of uh, facilitating public funding through tax rebates and private funding by um, making it easier for these uh, financial institutions to meet the European regulations. So we have to integrate the financial system in the team that um, is designing the system for clean, tech and clean technologies. And as I said before, we have to um, communicate this to everybody. And uh, there are more instruments. We have an integrated tool that measures the carbon footprint that was mentioned before, the environmental footprint, and the indicators of circular economy. This is another way of putting a stamp on certain companies or products because it's done from a double take of uh, organization and product in such a manner that we can guarantee that this product, this investment, and this organization are environmentally sustainable. So therefore, private funding has is, is much easier to uh, cope with for all of the funding that is reaching us from Europe. Or the banks themselves have to uh, cover the green business and it's much more straightforward for them when the time comes to facilitating or enabling access to funding in much better terms than what we have nowadays. And the time will come, perhaps it will take some time, but the time will come when this has to be um, put it out to our citizens. You've mentioned some examples now, but this uh, public and private coordination there are projects, and you've just mentioned one of the examples, but how is it possible to extend this to other areas? Well, I think that uh, the public and private partnership in relation to uh, funding is something that is related to the fact that a regulation that arrives from Europe has become an opportunity, and it's the financial institutions that are really knocking on the door of the public authority so that we can collaborate. The public administration finds that it's great for financial institutions to become involved. So I think that it's all about making the most of this uh, opportunity. It's true that lots of 
money is uh, arriving in the environmental area from Europe, but it's to be expected that in the next, in the next few years there's not going to be that much money. But so we have to try to materialize this advantage that we've uh, seen in these last few years now that we have a, a financial and a favorable economic situation. But I think that uh, the Basque country is an example of uh, private, and par private and public partnerships. We carried out an ecological transition. Those of us that are from areas that were degraded, we know that there was an ecological transition that has been carried out with everybody's agreement, uh, with the agreement of the citizens and the public sector. And the first infrastructures that was set up in the Basque country needed to have a social consensus, so we know how to get things done. And then not only that, but even more so, because we have investments, we have capacity, and we know uh, what path we have to follow because we have much more experience than uh, what we can do environmentally, and we know how we can invest that money so that we can uh, generate more businesses and more innovation and learn from what we've done. Great. Well, thank you very much then. Thank you both to both of you for all the clues you've given this afternoon. Well, thank you very much to all three of you for that roadmap you've just um, presented here. But now we're going to be moving on to the next uh, three levers that have to do with knowledge, with people, and social institutional capital. And we have uh, Mirin Estensoro from Orquesta, Ana Camacho from the Basque government, and Garvinia Banderola from BRTA. Thank you very much for being here this afternoon, for coming here. Good evening, as Marijo has just pointed out. We, in this second uh, part, are supposed to be dealing with the other, these other three levers that had to do with knowledge, with human capital, and social and institutional capital. So in this year's report, they've included new analysis that are related to these levers for the purpose of addressing the sustainable transition. Okay, well, let's kick off then with the uh, knowledge lever. It's known that the generation and use of knowledge is one of the fundamental requirements for the competitiveness of our territory. And the analysis of the report show that the research and development activities linked to so the sustainable transition has increased in recent years, especially resources that are used in for R&D in the area of uh, sustainable goods and technology. You can see that there's been an increase and this can be seen in how much more money is spent in the volume of funding and uh, money paid into R&D. This year we focused on the patent activity again in our territory. On this occasion we've uh, put on our glasses for the transition, but the Patent activity is pretty low compared to the average figures reported for Germany or Europe. However, it has to be underscored that our specialization in terms of uh, technological patents, uh, environmental technology, that is, has exceeded the levels reported in Europe. So therefore, we have a positive outcome that has to be taken into consideration. And then we have another issue that has been analyzed, which has to do with the quality of scientific papers. We've studied the quality of our scientific papers in areas related to sustainable uh, transition. The chart you can see on screen shows that the quality of scientific papers in the Basque Autonomous Community is higher than the European average. And this specialization is uh, very high and feels like energy or let's say underwater life or in sustainable cities. But what conclusion do we extract from all of this? One of the conclusions that I would like to underscore is that these analyses show that the knowledge base associated with the sustainable transition has increased and the quality has improved too. Although this does not suffice because what we have to do is gear this knowledge towards a transition that is sustainable. 
And in addition to that, we should also use this uh, knowledge that is being generated, and we'll go back to this issue later on, but it's going to be fundamental to reinforce the pathways that allow us to transfer the knowledge that we are producing. So now let's move on to the next level, which has to do with uh, human capital. And the environmental transition requires uh, that the economic model be transformed, which means that we have to create new jobs and that others disappear, and we have to transform a majority of the jobs. Well, bearing this in mind, uh, for this lever, what we've also performed is innovative analysis in this year's report. So we started off by looking to those occupations that have a bigger environmental impact and we rated them in the report as uh, occupations with uh, green potential. We talk about occupations with the capacity to create and to adapt and to implement uh, sustainable solutions in production processes and economic processes. And this is what we call um, occupations with a green potential. And these occupations account for 9.2% of the occupied population of the Basque Autonomous Community and they are related above all to the area of engineering and also to technical staff and scientific and intellectual staff. So by means of an innovative methodology what we have done is uh, looked into the educational supply that we have for these highly potential occupations. Now, what have professionals learned? What is it that they have learned that could have an influence on the green transition. Well, the next chart shows, in relation to the previous one, it shows the presence of university grades of uh, engineering, or degrees rather, especially mechanical engineering. So, as regards vocational training, the most important ones are the prevention of risks, for instance, or analysis and control of quality, or whatever is related to landscape and rural areas. But what we have observed is that there's no doubt that we need to incorporate into these processes capabilities that would allow us to carry out an environmental and energy transition. And we have to go into much greater depth of the analysis of these green skills. And we also have to boost them. So this would be one of the key elements, without a doubt. And this is related to two key challenges that we already pointed out in the report from 2019. On the one hand, we have to develop an educational system based on developing competencies that should include the green skills. And secondly, we cannot forget either uh, continuous training. And even more so, as Susanna pointed out, by bearing in mind the good results that we have obtained in this field. Right, well, let's move on to the sixth and final uh, lever, that is uh, social capital, or the transfer of social capital. And here there are several elements that have a direct influence on the environmental transition, that is laws, bills, the institutional structure, the social values, all of them are examples. But in this year's report, however, we have focused on a very specific element which has to do with collaborative governance. And I would like to explain why this is so. So all of the things we've said until now at this seminar have made us draw a very clear-cut conclusion. This is something Malikov mentioned. The environmental transition poses a very complex challenge. What does that mean? It means that it affects all of the agents in the territory. And this means that we are um, seeing that there are different points of view, different stories, different interests. So each and every one of us are take our own decisions and there's nobody that can decide on our behalf. So consequently, in order to solve a problem that affects all of us, we also need to have everybody's assistance. And we've also seen that in the analysis of the rest of the levers, well, we have uh, technical and technological knowledge, and we also have uh, the capabilities of people and the capabilities offered by infrastructures, but they on their own are not going to solve our problems. They are necessary but not sufficient. 
So what we're going to be missing, what we have to do is integrate these capabilities in our daily work and in the decisions that are taken at the headquarters of the different institutions. So this means that we need to have a collaborative governance. So we also know that there are diverse experiences of uh, collaborative actions in the Basque region and the report mentions the learning acquired in the process that Orquesta has enabled through research and development actions and whose objective has been to build um, collaborative models and we're going to ask some questions to describe this. Well firstly to structure and to institutionalize collaboration we have to create and structure spaces of dialogue between the different agents involved but to address this challenge we have to forget about uh, technical reports and uh, unilateral decisions but the first question would be are there enough dialogue spaces underway or should we create other complementary and new spaces and in the case of those that we already have are we working for there to be a connection between them? In a second, let's assume that we already have spaces open for dialogue and that we've uh, reached an agreement in terms of the challenges, that we've included the necessary agents. Well, another key element has to do with defining the roles played by the agents involved in these spaces of dialogue based on reciprocity and trust. So agents should uh, recognize each other mutually and they should also participate and recognize the capacity they have to influence others in these processes. And this is where the second question comes in. Do we know what our role is in this transition? And then on the other hand, do we know, do we accept the role that everybody else is playing? One of the outcomes of this dialogue will be a shared vision. So this should help us uh, ship and construct this shared vision. That doesn't, mean that, that doesn't mean that everybody agrees, but that we are aware of the points of view and opinions of each one. So a shared vision will allow us to agree on shared agendas that will cover what it is we're going to do and how we're going to do that. And the question, therefore, would be, do we have in our territory, do we have a shared agenda to further sustainable competitiveness with regard to the environment? Well, we'll have to take uh, difficult decisions along the way as a country. And we also have to be very brave and we know that we'll have to deal with complex situations. We know that that's going to happen. We know that there are going to be clashes between all the participants. But what we have to do is, well, let's say, reveal these uh, problems. But are we ready to address this in a constructive manner, these conflicts that are going to crop up? Finally, we will have to focus on something that you possibly is very familiar to all of you people that have worked with us in the area of collaborative governance. And this is the figure of the facilitator because we know that all of us will have, at some point in time, will play this uh, facilitator role. It doesn't suffice to play the role of an agent or an actor. And the interaction I refer to is also our responsibility. But are we ready for that, to be facilitators in um, sustainable transition? Well, these are the questions then. And now let's move on to the second uh, part of this dialogue. Ana y Garbine. Both of you are very important agents in this uh, process. And I would like to take this opportunity to well, hold a very straightforward dialogue in, in a very few minutes, just a short dialogue, or to do this work that the facilitator does. And this is for you, Anna. The industrial and energy transition policy. So, which do you think are the those uh, key spaces for dialogue that I mentioned before to address this sustainable transition, and also to address this challenge of being able to achieve sustainable competitiveness? And if we already have these uh, spaces for dialogue, do we have to create new ones? Well, firstly. 
I would like to underscore the importance that collaborative governance has in this transition, according to what you pointed out, because of all the complexity that is involved, especially in this particular territory, in which apart from in the institutional complexity, and you know that we are an industrial territory, and it's not the same thing in how you address the energy transition or climate change in a territory like ours compared to other places where they have other characteristics. So I think that uh, it's very pertinent to address collaborative governance. As regards spaces, I think that we have a number of formal spaces that, yes, they are running, they are operating, and from the government's perspective, there are different groups, inter institutional groups and interdepartmental groups, and there are also pilot groups in which we are sharing uh, spaces and different administrations too, even with the private sector. So what I mean to say is that there are several formal spaces that are up and running, but perhaps it's equally true that what we will have to do is create some other spaces. And in this uh, connection, I'd like to give you two examples that I, we are currently working on. And uh, now with the bill on climate change and the energy transition, we are considering setting up an office for energy transition and climate change. And this is a technical element, but which has a very clear coordination character and a training character too. It also provides information, and we want there to be a collaboration between the different agents and the different uh, bodies involved. And it also contemplates the possibility of there being citizens' associations that, that could become involved with different commissions, etc. Because I think that these are new spaces that will have to be set up, and let's see how they evolve. And then we have the example, which I think has to do with uh, a new governance approach. I believe that it, it contains all the ingredients that we've been talking about, which is the um, supercluster that we've mentioned before. This is an initiative that has been led by the Basque government together with the two major um, utilities of the Basque country, but with a very outstanding role played by the energy cluster that is leading the supercluster with another five uh, um, cluster organizations that are those that are now um, planting the seeds for specific projects to be carried out. So this is a, a complex governance model, but in which what they are doing is addressing the complexity of the problem or the challenges through the different projects that have to be carried out. Okay, thank you. Garvinje, a question for you now. Well, you represent that subsystem of knowledge, and uh, you are um, dedicated to this transition. So, up to what extent do you think that the agents of this uh, subsystem of knowledge, up to what extent do you think that they would be able to participate in the key sectors? Up to what extent would their, is their presence real? And what uh, challenges have you observed in relation to this subject? I'm sorry, but um, my voice is not very good this afternoon. But anyway, yes, a transfer is my area of work. But it's also the sphere of work for BRTA. But we generate knowledge, but we make it available to society. What does that mean, that we make it available to the entire population, to companies, to the public or administration, etc.? So we are not in the decision-making areas because our objective is to generate knowledge and to make it available to everybody. Yes, we are on the boards, on the consultancy or the advisory boards, rather. And there, as a consequence of an extensive experience of many years, we have obtained a um, high degree of legitimacy because our word, our opinion is taken into account. So this is something that reaches out to these decision-making bodies because we offer objective data that are based on science and technology. But what we do is interpret all this information so that it can be used to take decisions. And these uh, advisory boards, yes, we are represented on, that is the members of BRTA, as well as the experts from the different centres, whether it be in the Basque Autonomous Community, in the rest of Spain, 
but also, for instance, on the European or international plane. And as an example, and as we are talking about the environment here, there are many experts from the ASPI Centre in places where decisions are made in relation to fishing activities people that are going to take decisions or are going to advise people that are going to take decisions so yes i think that yes we do have uh, a certain amount of legitimacy because the uh, what we do is taken into account but these international boards it's something that we have to bring here because we learn a lot in these international boards but here we have a certain circumstances and certain resources and so on and so forth but there's a challenge here when we have to decide how we can bring this over here and use it in these uh, mechanisms in these areas our responsibility is not only about uh, providing information but it's also about uh, carrying on generating knowledge so that we can be one step ahead of the needs that society is going to have to deal with well thank you very much to both of you Well, before we spoke about the need to address the how we respond to conflicts, but if we want to um, boost the competitiveness from the point of view of the environment, which are the biggest conflicts that we are encountering in our territory, and to what extent do you think that we have a culture to address these conflicts? And if we, do we have spaces and methodologies to offer real and shared solutions? Well, perhaps this is so. Or, or do we have them or do we not have them? What could you say about this, Garvinia? Well, I've worked for many years in the area of uh, the environment. And I say that uh, compared to 15 or 20 years ago, the conflict, the conflict of interest is not related to answering what has to be done because we all have environmental issues and these problems are very well known and everybody accepts that they exist, for instance, climate change everybody accepts that this exists and then for that also that we need to achieve a carbon neutrality which is something that we all accept so we have to answer how and when and this is where the conflict resides so how can when can we reach total or partial neutrality and how this could be done well from the point of view of the industrial policy and the energy transition angle so where are these possible conflicts or interferences? Well, firstly, well, two very important challenges that have uh, cropped up in the previous lectures, which I understand are key issues when you are more or less successful. On the one hand, the investments that have to be made, the enormous uh, amounts of money that have to be invested to address this transition and we've already seen some issues uh, related to this or some questions. Yes, there are funds, but it's necessary to set up an ecosystem that is uh, favorable, not only for the industry, but for the entire economy. And in this connection, we have, we are working with the government to uh, lead a new project for the financial class that will have addressed the issue of financial of sustainable funding that was mentioned here, which is one of the key elements to be considered. Well, innovation at all levels, so from the organizational perspective, from the governance angle, as we have already mentioned, and in these uh, cases, well, I think that, well, this is what was mentioned before. There's an approach, there's a differential approach between the traditional industrial clusters and the new value chains that are cropping up so we have to be innovative when the time comes to valuing how we are going to manage these value chains that are based on capabilities and are based on uh, providing solutions for the new challenges that are being generated and uh, how we can coordinate all these things with the traditional clusters in each sector and but this is where the projects are going to arise that are going to be much more interesting. So what has allowed us to manage these differences in terms of interest is, has to do with the organizational condition of the department for 
economic and social development and the environment and uh, the environment is integrated with the department and it coexists with the rest of the in elements industry technology innovation architecture fisheries in other words all of those things that we understand have a lot to say they share objectives as mentioned before and uh, possibly there could be a certain misalignment but let's say that having them under the same umbrella and uh, having them in the same plan or in the same strategy in the end that means that decision making becomes much more agile and you cannot lose the focus on many occasions because if otherwise we would uh, come across uh, confrontations in other regions in other territories where people don't understand that everything is all about um, achieving a high degree of competitiveness in the territory and if there's a confrontation this definitely would not be helpful well this has to do with the final element too and how to as actors in this territory we have the responsibility of enabling the collaboration and, and I don't know what extent you consider that the role played by the public authorities should change so that we can do something in the area of sustainable transition and uh, therefore act as enablers to construct that uh, collaborative governance or the collaboration between uh, agents. So I think that this is what we're being done by the government and uh, well I think that uh, this depends on the agents involved, it depends on the maturity of uh, the technologies and of uh, the needs in terms of resources because sometimes uh, while well, we um, take on board a leadership role if you don't do this from the public sphere it's uh, complicated for certain projects to uh, work or for us to carry certain initiatives and on other occasions well let's say that that's a more collaborative or co-investment role it has to do with the providing more support in certain points in time and for this in the end I think that what we have is a good infrastructure of uh, public uh, companies and it could be them that take the initiative of uh, supporting a private initiative in certain cases and we're seeing how there are projects that are directly uh, working with uh, different uh, Basque organizations and private companies and they are implementing projects. I think that the role played by the government is different but it changes. And what about you Garbine and uh, from BRTA? You boost collaboration between different technology centers I think and that's your job that's your job as uh, enablers and what can we learn from your experience and what is even more curious you can also become enablers based on knowledge well on the one hand we have objectivity that is associated with knowledge so therefore we have well we have to um, be impartial in the way we work and this what it means is that we approve or that we accept that the figure of the enabler of the enabling organization and you must bear in mind that BRTA has as its goal has the objective of doing the uh, providing a connection between the different uh, bodies involved why well because uh, this uh, is uh, made up of five public organizations so this has to be placed in line with the work done by technology centers and this is uh, in our DNA and it's something that we have to do in the task that we are supposed to carry out and then on the other hand uh, these interests or these uh, conflicts of interest between the different centers are when there's a um, shared interest well being able to um, do something at a larger scale and this is what we do on a daily basis and BRTA uh, appeared in 2019 and all of us have uh, been researchers our daily tools were related to Excel tools but now we're talking about uh, work groups and uh, people and this is when we notice that we what we need we need new methodologies because uh, we cannot limit ourselves to 
introducing formulas in the different cells. No, we need to use the telephone. We need to um, generate trust. And I think that organizations like ours should um, cover that itinerary. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm afraid we ran out of time 40, no, 20 minutes ago. I would like to thank both of you for being here tonight, and many thanks to the audience. And uh, uh, many thanks for allowing us to uh, put across, uh, the, to hold this dialogue. And now I'm going to give the floor back to Mariko so that she can, with a bit of luck, close the proceedings. Well, OK, thank you to all three of you for these uh, possible actions that you've uh, mentioned to advance towards a sustainable transition. Jorge, the coordinator for energy and environment at uh, Orquesta, is going to present the main recommendations that we've extracted from the analysis. So go ahead. The analysis for this report uh, presents six recommendations to make further progress in terms of sustainable transition in the Basque Country. Firstly, we have to design an intelligent transition. And what this means, on the one hand, that we have to implement a sustainable transition process based on a strategic vision that is clear, shared, and uh, long term. And it also means that we have to advance in decarbonization and we have to use uh, technological and energy uh, pillars, and we have to establish uh, pragmatic goals that are coherent with the Basque economy and uh, areas in which it's possible to reduce uh, greenhouse gases without endangering economic activity or new opportunities that do not compromise the social and economic well-being of our society. We have to develop new technologies and uh, an innovative and competitive framework in areas like decarbonization or advanced environmental services. Finally, this also means that we have to promote legal and regulatory frameworks that are simple, stable, and uh, transparent, geared towards obtaining results that are flexible to deal with contingencies and that will allow companies to compete in global markets. The second recommendation is that we have to execute R&D plus I policies that are geared towards obtaining results. The objective of these policies should be to advance in terms of environmental sustainability by establishing synergies with economic competitiveness and improvements in the well-being of people. And uh, knowledge and innovation are key tools to identify and make use of the opportunities opened up by a sustainable transition. And uh, equally important, um, we're experimenting with R&D and I policies through pilot projects like uh, learning, and through the development of methodologies that will allow us to evaluate and uh, analyze the effective use of the available resources. The third recommendation is that we have to reinforce uh, key transversal areas. We have to boost areas key transversal areas to foster the competitiveness of the Basque economy. And firstly, we have to talk about the ecosystem of uh, knowledge transfer in areas of sustainability and critical areas like eco design and uh, strategic raw materials or industrial policies. Secondly, the we have to attract talent and we have to provide training, and we have to dynamically address the human capital of the territory and bring it in line with the capacities that are demanded for sustainable transitions. And thirdly, the ecosystem the, for funding, which is critical to develop mechanisms and tools that are adequate to direct enough flows of private and capital capital to the funding of infrastructures in projects and activities that are sustainable. And finally, 
the intermediary organizations like uh, local development agencies and uh, the dynamizing organizations for clusters with a critical role. They have to support SMEs and uh, value chains that are relevant so that they can address efficiently address technological changes in processes, in regulations and markets, and therefore make use of the business opportunities and increase their competitiveness. And fourthly, we should uh, boost the role played by citizens. Basque citizens will play an active role in sustainable transition. And it will be boosted on the one hand by having more knowledge and by empowering people so that people can take informed decisions as regard participating in different initiatives like energy, communities, new forms of mobility, circular economy, etc. And it will be relevant to achieve a higher level of uh, citizen support and for people to know the benefits and the costs. And finally, we do not only have to increase the amount of information that is made available, but we also have to design and deploy schemes and mechanisms that will allow us to protect the most vulnerable segments of the population. Fifth, we have to innovate in terms of governance and uh, collaboration. We have to carry on collaborating in how we collaborate will be one of the success factors for the sustainable transition process. We have to value the knowledge and the experience accumulated over the last decades in the Basque country on how we can construct a, a strategy and a shared agenda with the different agents in a collaborative manner by managing the inevitable stresses or different interests that are brought about by the complexity of the process. And we also have to implement uh, collaborative governance mechanisms that are effective, that are based on co-responsibility and reciprocity between the different agents in the future, built on climate change and uh, environmental transition. And number six, well, we have to consolidate the Basque country as a leading territory, because the Basque country has to play a protagonist role in international initiatives related to energy and sustainability technological innovation and other areas in which it can lead the path towards uh, measures that will reduce the environmental footprint of uh, our country and also generate um, business fabric that is specialized and competitive. We have examples of this in the initiative of the Nest Industrial Zero Basque Industrial Culture Cluster, sorry, or the uh, the permanent, uh, the standing office of the uh, local 2030 agenda of the United Nations that will be focusing on much more local environments. And what we have to do is increase our competitiveness and improve uh, environmental sustainability by exporting this uh, approach to other countries. We have to export clean uh, technologies and knowledge through the leadership of the Basque companies in international markets uh, where the Basque companies are competing. And once we've uh, presented these six recommendations to advance in the area of uh, this transition, the final message is that the, the sustainable transition represents a major opportunity for the Basque country. So in a nutshell, the main conclusion of our report is that regardless of the complexity of the process, there's a big potential to coordinate all of the different uh, territorial and business elements uh, in relation to environmental sustainability so that we can produce the desired results from the different points of view, economic and social. It's essential to generate economic value and well-being through a high degree of specialization in sustainable activities and technologies and also to develop more innovation in terms of sustainability so that Basque companies and the Basque country can play a leadership role in this transition. But this cannot be carried out without taking decisions now because uh, the sustainable transition poses risks and also implies costs and sacrifices. And we have to address some uncomfortable dilemmas and decisions too. However, and uh, advancing in this transformation under a clear strategy will allow us uh, to materialize uh, the economic opportunities and industrial opportunities linked to the changes that are already underway. And without a doubt, this will all have a net uh, effect a net positive effect for the Basque society in the mid and long term. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, okay, Jorge, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very, very much. 
And we, as we said at the beginning, we have a significant opportunity here, but we also are facing a tremendous challenge because many times uh, sustainability and uh, competitiveness are compatible and they can uh, be developed uh, together, but in other cases, uh, it uh, becomes a difficult mission, and this uh, requires a collaboration between all of us. And uh, also, we have to work uh, with a commitment so that we can advance. And this is the commitment that we have adopted at Orchestra, and which we hope we'll be able to carry on working with all of you people to conclude. And uh, I would like to give the floor to our Deputy General, Eider Mendoza, so that she can close this meeting and say goodbye to all of us. Hello. Good evening, everybody. As I know that competitiveness is a very important uh, issue in our territory, on behalf of the Provincial Council, I would like to thank Orquesta for all the work that these people have done and for the report that they publish on a yearly basis because I find that it's very interesting because this generates uh, advanced uh, knowledge. And as has been pointed out here on more than one occasion, this uh, knowledge, this advanced knowledge is something that uh, has to be uh, transferred to our society. And not only that, this also poses a number of challenges uh, for us as a territory and uh, it appeals to us. It is asking us to to well, carry out these recommendations because many times what we think is that the competitiveness uh, corresponds uh, to uh, the company itself, but it's also the territory that has to be competitive uh, for this to happen. And in this regard, I would like to underscore several factors because I think that they are essential I have to underscore that it's essential to have a, uh, an advanced science and technology network that then, as has just been pointed out, that can then transfer all of this uh, knowledge into the uh, business fabric. And another fact to be taken into account is that we need to have a um, system that supports companies and that helps them to deal with their challenges and also to evolve. And thirdly, I would also like to point out that what we need, we need to have uh, public authorities that are competitive, that are agile, that are professional, and that also respond in a solid uh, manner to the petitions or requests they receive from, their, from society. As the person responsible for this area at the Provincial Council of Gibothwa, I must say that our organization wants to be an institution that has to become more and more competitive in the future. That's our goal. And at the same time, this report that has been presented here tonight has also reminded us that sustainability is a very important factor uh, as uh, regards uh, competitiveness. It's crucial and it's uh, inevitable too because there are two things that I would like to point out of things that have been discussed here this evening. One, On the one hand, we have sustainability as an opportunity as has just been pointed out now. And secondly, we have a governance, collaborative governance as has also been mentioned in this uh, final part, in this uh, final intervention. Sustainability as an opportunity we are um, an industrial territory. Without industry, there's no such thing as well-being. So therefore, it is absolutely fundamental. So what I would like to say are a couple of things, so things that have to do with the Gibuthkwa industry that is now addressing this energy transition and decarbonization. Since the year 2005, CO2 emissions uh, reported in the industry have been reduced by 30.9%. The consumption of energy since 2005 in this industrial sector has dropped by 47, 46.1%. And um, but what has to be pointed out is that we still have a very long way to go in the territory and in the industry within this uh, area of uh, sustainability. Because what I understand is that sustainability is a challenge. But I know that this challenge has some major dimensions that have to do with mobility or which have to do with um, wind power. And I know that we have the entire um, 
value chain in our territory. And we have a very significant technological industrial capabilities that we have to maintain and that we have to extend. And secondly, as I mentioned previously, collaborative governance that was already referred to is not possible to do all the things we have to do, at least we won't be doing things properly if we don't base this thing on collaborative governance, on collaboration, because at the Provincial Council we have a project that is just that, that allows us to identify and uh, to uh, um, give support to deal with those uh, uh, challenges. And if the Provincial Council we want to have that uh, collaborative governance project, we wouldn't have implemented the Mobility Center or the Natur Klima Center either, nor Dragoyena 2 and T30. The initiative that is currently being uh, carried out, well, all of these initiatives, all these projects have been carried out in collaboration with other people. But to finish, I would like to um, express uh, our commitment from the Provincial Council as a territory we want to carry on. Um, dealing with this uh, challenge of sustainability and in relation to it what we are going to do is we are going to address the subject of sustainability by reinforcing public policies in different uh, areas of circularity, energy transition and, uh, and renewable energies, renewables, etc. All of the opportunities that crop up we're going to make use of and this effort is something that we're going to be basing of course on collaboration. Thank you very much everybody and congratulations Orquesta wholehearted congratulations for the work you've done and thank you for this advanced knowledge you're making available to us and apart from that it's uh, this responsibility you have of reaching out to where you have to go with this knowledge so that it can be truly efficacious thank you very much and many many thanks for your hard work Okay, well, thank you very much for your attention, for having um, come here this evening. And now we have a reception and we can carry on with our informal chat outside. Right, so we can have a drink and have a chat. So let's go.